Greetings fellow herbalists on this Sunday, Day of the Sun. The, so the sun is the source of vital power in the solar system. The sun influences spirit, the moon and matter. Herbs of the sun include chamomile, calendula, frankincense, lovage and saffron. Hot, electric, vital and positive. Sun herbs harvested on the Sunday in their earth hour have affinity to body parts depending on where the moon is in the sky at the time of harvest. This comes from cosmological and biodynamic traditions used in this land. It is also World Mental Health Day. My name is Claudia Manchanda and I'm a medically trained herbalist. I refer to myself as a radical herbalist. And I'd like to thank the NIMH for having me here today. It is long overdue. I'm here to talk about uncomfortable truths, uncomfortable for all. This conference is being held at a time where governments around the world are manufacturing culture wars against the very notion of decolonization. The UK Minister of Equality, Kemi Badenoch, has stated she does not care about colonialism and was appointed by Boris Johnson, who said colonialism in Africa should have never ended. <laughs> The photos on the screen in front of me represent protests of recent decolonization acts. The top left picture is of Edward Colston, who initially traded wine and fruit and textiles via Spain and Portugal, but in 1680 joined the Royal African Company, becoming the deputy governor in 1689. Colston made his fortune through human trafficking and suffering. Between 1672 and 1689, ships transported about 80,000 men, women, and children from Africa to the colonies. The picture of his, is, of his, is of his toppled statue. On the right is a photo of red paint thrown at the statue of Queen Victoria outside the state legislature in British Columbia in the wake of 250 stolen children's bodies found under the Camp Loops residential school on unceded Sequepec land. Since then, more babies have been found. On the left is a picture from Mexican excellent of Chit Lally saying, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Holism, radical herbalism and some definitions. So why do we study herbal medicine? This is a question I urge you to explore later on after watching this um, lecture. What is holism? Holism is a theory that parts of the whole are in intimate interconnection such that they cannot exist independently of the whole. One cannot be understood without reference to the whole, hence the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Holism is often applied to mental states, language, ecology, society and the environment, and of course in herbal medicine when assessing a person's case history, the entourage effects of chemicals in one plant, and the balance of an entire plant prescription. An example is the, the, the destruction of Cubbington Woods by HS2, um, given the okay by this government, but destruction of the woods is going to affect the people that destroy the woods and the progeny of the government. Radical herbalism comes from the word radix. In Latin, radix means root. Radical herbalism is about love, care, and holistic healing. Medical herbalism is a modern take on using plants, often using reductionist science to verify plant use. I'm not saying science isn't important. It's immensely important, but it's also steeped in troubling practices, bias, and often driven by profit, devoid of love and care. Radical herbalism is founded upon the following. Healthcare is a right and not a privilege. Do you only, do only privileged people access your practice? Health is inextricably linked to the health of our ecosystems. Extractive capitalism has harmed everything. Harm has been and is caused by the state and capitalist institutions and the need for creative and sustainable alternatives are essential. Marginalized and indigenous people are best to lead this. 
It uses plant medicine to support people and animals in a holistic way, always giving back to the earth. It acknowledges the colonial backdrop of medicine and the cause of dis-ease. It honors thousands of years of indigenous traditional knowledge and that knowledge is power. It views herbs as just one way to harmonize ourselves with the universe. It's founded on learning and liberation. Examples include the community apothecaries and gardens, herbalists without borders who go to camps in Calais dispensing herbs, street herbalists like Herbalista and the Dublin Herb Bite with shopping trolleys of bottles and balms and teas and antiviral mixes for COVID, foot clinics and projects hidden for fear of being shut down. Intergenerational trauma and epigenetics is recognized in the many he healing traditions as something that can be healed methodologically. In traditional Chinese, in the Ming Chinese medicine, the Ming Meng near the second vertebrae around the kidneys holds ancestral power. The history lecturer, Dr. Aki Mehara, says when you learn about the struggle people have had for survival, for self-determination, for freedom and liberation, this is what defines social justice. It's the history of struggle. How can we be committed to social justice, ethics or science without knowing the history? History affects every generation. Colonialism is a state-sponsored, multidisciplinary process that involves the economic, the cultural, legal, ideological and material domination of one people over another. It brought genocide, disease, dispossession and conflict, and it exists in front of our eyes every day. Currently, this week, in Del Rio, Texas, Border Patrol agents on horseback with, with the horse's reins are whipping Haitian migrants trying to cross the border to survive. Between 1540 and 1850, an estimated 15 million people were taken from Africa and brought for forced labor to the Western Hemisphere. 20 million indigenous people of the so-called Americas were killed by European invasion. King Leopold II from Belgium was responsible for the death of 10 million Africans. The partition in 1947 of India killed 2 million people and 20 million people were displaced, my family included. 20,000 Aboriginal people were killed after Europeans' immediate arrival on the land known as Australia. Britain were forced to pass legislation to abolish slavery in 1834 due to the Haitian uprisings and the British awarded £28 billion compensation to the so-called owners of enslaved people. Three million people died from famine in Bengal under British occupation, where, they were, where there were enough food supplies to feed everyone. Churchill blamed Indians. He said they breed like rabbits. They're beastly people with a beastly religion. Currently, today, charter flights are booked for this Christmas day to deport lorry drivers overstaying their three months visa by a day. Decolonization is a conceptual process that's been used by many scholars, but notably Leopold Seder Senghor, Amy Cesar, Franz Farnan, Ngugi Wathongyo and Audrey Lord, all scholars of African origin. That's pictures of them. Decolonization is about decentering the wild, the, the white male patriarchal gaze and acknowledge what I've heard described as the bleaching of history. Vintina Blackburn reminds us that whiteness is not a person. It's a proximity to privilege and actualized at institutional levels and largely through omission. There are personal and systemic acts of decolonization. When I was lecturing in uni, I was once asked to dress professionally when I wore a beautiful, colorful Indian outfit. So my continuing to wear my own dress was like a small act of defiance. The historian Chitlali from, America, from Mexican Excellence says, decolonization is the deconstruction of ideologies, belief systems, hierarchies that have long defined the human experience which stem from the system of white supremacist racism. This process is not about simply 
undoing physical colonization. It's multifaceted dismantling of the inhumane world that forces all people of color to conform to ideas it fabricates in regards to knowledge, value systems, and beauty. To decolonize is to humanize. In herbal medicine, it relates to historical legacy. Who gets to tell the story of herbs and how? Who attends schools and accesses herbal medicine? And how do they access the medicine? Privilege always shapes knowledge dissemination. Western herbal medicine has acquired herbs from all of the continents that we utilize, often without acknowledgement of their original names, their meanings, their tradition, and their relationship to the people who use it ancestrally. At what cost does the acquisition of the plants have to the land, the ecosystem, the humans and animals of the original place? Here is a map showing um, all of the places that Britain did not colonize. And if you Google, you can see that there are loads of maps for each European country. They're quite um, alarming. When young children are learning to speak, they mimic what they hear. Chomsky, the linguist, described how language influences thought processes and even our actions. 30% of the 7,400 languages on the planet are endangered. A recent study in Zurich found that 73% of all medicinal knowledge in Turtle Island known as North America, was, one, was found in one endangered language. The same researcher said, quote, even the best taxonomists would be amazed by the breadth of knowledge indigenous cultures know not only about plants, animals and their inter interrelations. Most of this is not written and passed through oral trans tradition. Another report came out recently which found that but the birds, jays, are responsible for 50% of tree growth in the new forest in the UK. In Arabic, there are 14 names of love or states of love. Al-Hawa, attraction. Al-Sabwa, amusement. Al-Shagaf, passion. Al-Waj, preoccupation. Al-Kalaf, infatuation. Al-Oshuk, adulation. Al Najwa, her heartburn. Al Shok, longing. Al Wasab, a scrutating pain. Al Itsikana, submissiveness. Al Wad, friendliness. Al Kola, unif unification, soulmate. Al Garam, fervor. Al Hoyam, madness. All sense has gone out of the window. The reason I give these words is just, just to show the depths of different languages. Um, when you speak English, you, um, which a lot of people call the colonizer's tongue, you think in the colonizer's language. Um, there's also um, a way of decolonizing language by not normalizing problematic terms. So I'm going to give you some examples. Botanical collections I call imperial thievery. Slave, I say enslaved human. Colonialism, I call genocide, criminal ecocide. It's everywhere and it's about disconnect. Transatlantic slave trade, I say you cannot trade people. Even terms like ethnic cleansing are disturbing to me because humans cannot be cleansed away. In English, with all its constructions, associations, limitations and omissions, imagine the impact for learning names of illness, healing and plants including energetics from languages lost. Binomial names and colonial scientific European derived orders dominate the global standard. Learning and reclaiming traditional names enriches our relationship with the plant and living beings. Examples are Fan Chi, Astragalus, neutral food-like used for chronic conditions. Ichape, echinacea, tingling, bitter, pungent, but cooling. Kava, kava. Now that's in Tongan and it means bitter. It's also known as Ava, Yakona, and Malok. Horse chestnut is for horse, was used for horse chest infections. But I think when we hear the name horse chestnut, we don't even think of that anymore. 
The word for the earth is Pachamama, sacred mother earth. Science is held upon a platform of being unbiased, fair, logical, neutral, and even ethical. There's a class of medicine called etiology and pathophysiology. However, systemic causes are not addressed. Neither is prophylactic medicine, like, circad like circadian med medicine, doing a nine to five job was once considered a social norm. Now doing zero hour contracts is becoming a norm. Sick people have to prove that they're very ill to get benefits, and it's up to doctors to verify their sickness. Have you heard of the Tuskegee travesty where 400 African descendants in Turtle Island were deliberately not treated for syphilis purely to watch the course of the disease? This happened from 1932 to 1972. Medical research has so many horrors, even in herbal medicine, such as the burnt rat poor test and lethal dose 50s, where rodents are deliberately burnt and then treated with herbs. Black maternal mortality rates are five times higher than white women and brown women three times higher than white women. COVID and cancer death rates are far higher in BPOC populations, that's black and people of colour populations. One million people died of starvation in 1884 and 1851 and forced to leave their homelands to Turtle Islands where they became a source of cheap labor on indigenous homeland. Mental health detention is higher in black men and so are sections and death in mental health custody. When men studied birdsong, they described it as long, complex vocalizations of male birds during the mating season. When a woman challenged this by observing female birds, the alpine ascenters, she was met with resistance and she actually noticed that the female birds sang. Um, here's a picture that I do that represents the medical model and the medical model comes from um, protests against psychiatry in the 60s. And um, the medical model views uh, a patient as, you know, an object, abnormal. Um, they are treated with drugs. Um, the police may be called if they are psychotic. They are dull. They are silent. Sometimes the patient is demonized for talking about their medical experience or their emotional experience. It's steeped in racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia. The medical model fears death and aging. Um, it dominates children and it hasn't evolved methodologically. It is not really human centered. It looks at symptoms and not addressing the cause and the system of medicine doesn't heal itself. It's not individualized. There's no touch or love and the body is sectioned up into physiological systems, just like the borders of the earth. Decolonized approaches to um, medicine and existence revolve around kinship notions, societal structures. Um, um, plants are described as edible or non-edible. Um, the nomenclatures are different from um, binomial nomenclature. And a lot of um, language is um, revolved around survival for all and protection for all. In most traditional medicines around the world, there are rituals for stages and phases, like 40 days after a baby is born, the baby and the mother are protected and looked after. When someone dies, there's 40 days of mourning. Grandparents are revered, elders are looked after and looked up to. There is gender fluidity in most cultures. Most cultures have ancestral veneration in their healing. The notion of the sacred of the land of people is there. And in many cultures of the world to help someone is a privilege. And your human worth isn't about whether you can work or not. You can see a picture I've done about sort of social justice models of healing that include reparation, honoring ancestors, accounting for chronic stress and how that affects the body, addressing the air, the food, the water, access to nature, it would never call the police some, on someone who's in mental health crisis. It, you take a detailed case history, you listen, you see beauty and diversity. 
Herbs are not just used alone, but they're used with massage, cleansing baths, as food and convalescence. It's multi, multi-person cultural centered. Healing involves the whole family. It's holistic for the mind, body and spirit. And your trauma is real. This, um, this um, image flips Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, on its head. And it's the Blackfoot nations, they don't even use the word hierarchy, but order of needs, where mutual perpetuity and looking after each other is, is, is um, what, what is the top of the pyramid. Terra nullius is a principle that has been used in international law and all over the world, especially in places like Turtle Island, Canada, Palestine, Patagonia, Niger, Burkina Faso, Aotearoa. I'm reading a little section from Terra nullius by Claire George Coleman. Terra nullius was a legal fiction a declaration used to justify the invasion of Australia and the subjugation of, of people hundreds of years ago by United Kingdom, a more technologically advanced people. In translation from the long dead language Latin, it means nobody's land or empty earth. There were people in Australia when United Kingdom came. They had been there for tens of thousands of years. The declaration of terror nullius had the effect of defining the native inhabitants as non-humans. I use that term now because your colonization has done the same thing. Since invasion, you call it settlement. Of this planet, you have acted as if humans don't exist. If you acknowledge at all that we were there before your arrival, you believe we were rendered extinct by your expansion. This happened before. The English believed they had exterminated all of the Tasmanian Aborigines, the Palawa. In fact, they survived invasion. They still exist now. You act as if humans are extinct, but that is news to me. That's by Dr. Robert Black, the leader of the native delegation to the settler parliament. Colonial history of how plants and knowledge and knowledge of their use has entered our materia medica is completely absent. Did you know it was illegal for First Nations people in Turtle Island, named AK America, named after an Italian called Amerigo Vespucci, to practice their own medicine, to use smudge, to gift tobacco to Mother Earth, to attend ceremony, to visit sites, to visit sacred sites, right up until 1988. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act was only established in 1996. As students and herbalists, we hear little about Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. We may hear of chi, prana, or even karma, but, but do we know about the other systems of medicine or our own ancestral systems? Q's director, Richard Deverell says, we have to have honest conversations about colonial foundations and biodiversity, climate change, and acknowledge the exploitative and racist legacies. He said, we can tell stories through living things. However, their purpose was for empire building and colonial expansion. A huge budget in parliament under the Indian office and al allocated to Q was allocated to Q for this purpose. What were clipper and kidnap ships made of? Botanical gardens were made to research plants of economic and extractable significance. They contained glass houses for different climates. They kept records of performance as plants were there to perform, and they kept catalogues of holdings. They shared seeds from, for inf of information from other centers globally, particularly from tropical settings. They were places to study taxonomy, phytochemistry, experiment with hybridization, and maintain field work 
collectors. All of the above still occur. Ultimately, moving one plant from one continent to another continent to get one people from one continent to another continent to grow it and divide and rule. In the early 1800s, derisory comments about working class people visiting Kew Gardens can be seen in the botanical magazine of the time. Economic botany has been described as a bridging gap between the pure and applied botany potential use of studying the rich relationship that exists between plants and people, the past, the present, and potential uses of plants. However, it's intertwined with bioprospecting for valuable crops and other raw products to serve empire. Some expeditions haven't changed in 100 years. Locals are used to carry belongings, provide food and home to the explorers without being perceived as knowledge bearers, sharers and foremost custodians. The Banks building on the right hand picture was built in 1985 after Sir Joseph Banks, who died in 1820. Banks inherited vast swathes of Derbyshire, Lincolnshire and Sussex and was so immensely wealthy, he funded the famous trip on the Endeavour and much of the crew, including the collectors and illustrators. Charles Blagden, a working class man who was a secretary to Banks, sent specimens to Bank for financial favour. T, Camellia sinensis, was one such item. He was financially involved in prisons here and in Australia. He was famous for the, of being extravagant and over the top, fishing for tons of fish and hosting botanical breakfasts in Soho. Banks ordered the movement of breadfruit from Tahiti to the Caribbean as cheap food from slave people. David Attenborough described him as a gentleman of science and his work was for the benefit of all mankind. He brought back 400 species of plants that were unknown, but they were known. Then he stopped off in Rio. He went ashore illegally to steal plants. He took two African servants with him on the voyage and let them freeze to death in Tierra del Fuego. Banks called the Aboriginal people savages and perhaps the most uncivilized in the world. Despite their 50,000 year old culture or more, they saw indigenous planting methods as wasteful and stupid. They were tactical and sustained, but they were tactical and sustainable, and they are now being revived again to stop bushfires. The genus of plants Banksias, are named after him, were a source of nectar for Aboriginal people, and the seed codes were used as a hairbrush. As a member of the ruling class, Blanks had his house in Soho attacked in 1850 as part of the nationwide bread riots in demonstration against the Corn Laws. One of the samples he left behind was the pickled head of Permaloy, an Aboriginal leader who fought against the British invasion of his home. Yes, he kept a pickled head of a human being. Carl Linnaeus grew up in the early 1700s in a, in a then poor provincial town called Uppsala with lakes and islands, but, but poor soil and food shortages. His father was a rich botanist and, and he studied under Ander Celsius, the astronomer. He was obsessed with mapping and drawing as a young man and, with posi and positioning himself within the world. He had notes that included tea from Asia, coffee from Africa, America with chocolate and Europe with beer. He kept porcelain figures of different races and animals. Apart from taxonomy, his System Naturale, first published in 1735 in Amsterdam and then again in 1758, had a more disturbing edition of humours. He classified humans into four varieties based on geographical location of the four continents, based on skin colour, clothing, governance styles and characters. He said our differences are accidental. He describes a hierarchy in nature. In all, in all, in common, all humans have consciousness. I guess that means other species don't. Genus Homo, family Anthropomorpha, temperaments and constitutions as follows: African, blackish, sluggish, will never make the top. 
phlegmatic, tardy, and indifference, cover their body in fat, governed by the will of others. Linnaeus over-sexualizes African people by only describing their genital, genitalia and no one else. American, the noble savage, choleric, content, and free, have lives painted and governed by customs. Um, Linnaeus lived with the Sami in 1732, and that formed his um, perceptions of indigenous people in a different way. Asians, fuscus, that means dark and somber in color. Tawny, melancholic, proud and greedy, wear white clothes, governed by opinion. European, wear tight clothes. They were at the top in his latter version. Sanguine, hot, bright, intentive, governed by laws. Linnaeus sources are, to, are believed to have derived from the library of his professor, Olav Celsius, including the, natural, including the book, The Natural History of Brazil, edited by Philip Pizzo, which is the first record of the mention of the word caste. He met African and Asian people in Stockholm and Hamburg, but he never traveled far. He is relevant on a global scale because his students traveled and they were named the apostles of Linnaeus. Joseph Banks is one. Have you heard of Sloan Square? Han Sloan was an Anglo-Irish Scottish Protestant descended and referred to as um, the founding father of the Natural History Museum and the British Museums. His family was middle class, but serving the aristocracy. Sir Hans Sloan is presented as a hero, pioneer, um, a physician and a secretary, and then president of the Royal College of Royal Society of Physicians. He studied medicine and botany in London, Paris and Montpellier. At 27, he was appointed the physician to the governor of Jamaica. He married the previous plantation owner, his widow, and this financially enabled his collections. He had 71,000 items in his collections accrued through exploitation of African and indigenous people of the Caribbean. By the age of 93, he'd amassed a massive collection of 400,000 items, which he put, and he also purchased existing collections. He was very aware of the brutality of enslavement and wrote about the necessity to torture rebellious enslaved people. Part of his collection was skin samples from different people to view skin pigmentation. Racialized people were treated like specimens and disposable like plants. He spent all his earnings on Peruvian bark, which he then in turn sold on to London for vast, vast profits. Peruvian bark first appears in the London Pharmacopoeia in 1677. He provided the grounds for the Chelsea Physic Garden, which still exists with a gate that opens to the Thames when ships would come and bring in the botanical loot. Sir Isaac Newton describes Sloan as a villain, a, a rascal and a very tricky fellow. He's whimsically famous for adding milk to hot chocolate after apparently observing enslaved people drinking chocolate with water. He observed enslaved people's knowledge, their food and their culture, and he used them to draw illustrations, collect specimen, and he observed their own allotted pieces of land in the, in the plantation where they grew their own food. When I see the star cocoa specimen at the Natural History Museum, I wonder who grew it, who preserved it? What life did that person have? What was their name? In 1955, Aimé Césaire wrote, and what of museums? which Europe is so proud. It would never, it would have been better if all things considered, if they had never been necessary to open them. Better if the Europeans had allowed the civilizations beyond the continent of Europe to live alongside them, dynamic, prosperous, whole and unmutilated. Better if they had not let those civilizations develop and flourish rather than offering up scattered limbs duly labeled for us to admire. After all, by itself, the museum is nothing. It can say nothing. Here in the museum, the rapture of self-gratification rots our eyes. Here, a secret contempt of others dries up our hearts. Here, racism, 
no matter if it's declared or undeclared, drains away all empathy. No, in the scales of knowledge and the mass of all museums in the world could never outweigh a lone spark of empathy. Curandismo is a traditional medicine in Abya Yala, otherwise known as South America. It's curandas um, say that disease or illness follows strong emotional states like fear, rage, envy, mourning or a painful loss, being out of balance or harmony with one's environment. A patient is often um, seen as the innocent victim of malevolent forces. The soul may be separated um, from the body and cure and healing requires the participation of the whole family. The natural world is not always distinguishable from the supernatural and sickness serves a social function to increase the tension and rallying around of the family and the patient to reestablish a sense of belonging and re-socialization. Indigenous people respond better to interactions with their healer. In Curando, there's many branches of healers and uh, they include the uh, yoberos, which are herbalists. And even within yoberos, there are tabaqueros who use tobacco, the ayahuasqueros who, use, who make and um, take ayahuasca. Um, they don't actually give the ayahuasca to patients. They take it to be able to heal the patients. Peyoteros, um, husueros, which is the uh, muscular skeletal bone setters, um, the oracionistas, they do the prayers and incantations, the sobadors, the masos, and the brujas, the witches. Quechua people of the, of the Andean republics, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Peru, use powdered quina quina for shivering and perhaps a muscle relaxant as a bitter and for viral infections. In the 1600s, indigenous people were well acquainted with the medicinal, medicinal properties of their home. Guayacum and sarsaparilla are examples of other herbs taken during this period. The plant contains bitter quinolone alkaloids. Oh, by the way, the word alkaloid comes from the Arabic meaning. Calcinated ashes. An overdose of these alkaloids causes ringing in the ears, tinnitus, headaches, and visual disturbance and nausea. Quinine, cinchinine, cinchonidine, and quinidine all interfere with the reproduction of the malaria parasite, but quinine the most effective. For millennia, the wealthy of Europe fled to cooler climes in malaria season, leaving the working classes to fevers, artemisias, and bloodletting. Malaria carrying mosquitoes have been found in amber dating back 30 million years ago. In the past, it's only in the past 100 years that treatments have actually been useful. 252 million cases were reported of malaria in 2010. That's 2% of the then global population. 67% of those infected um, are under fives. It's postulated that malaria was brought to the Americas by Jesuit monks. Many people of West Africa develop sickling cells, which partially causes resistance. It has been said that malaria provided a temporary protection from the invasion of cholera until they utilized Kina Kina. After Kina Kina is three years old, the bark can be stripped in a sustainable way. William Dawson Hooker, the son of William Hooker, the director of Kew, wrote that it's okay to fell the entire tree. Instead of bark stripping, he said was okay because the insects would, be, would, would eat the mutilated trees. Joseph Banks had long awaited the transfer of Cinchona to India. Cinchona is Kina Kina. Where eventually in 1855, Royal arranged for the transfer of six Kina Kina trees to India, but they died due to dampness. Clements and Markham spoke both Quechua and Spanish, and they knew three species and knew three species of Kina Kina by sight, and was given were given 500 pounds to acquire the species, 
at as the cost of the plant was costing the Indian office an epic £53,000 per year to buy the bark. Hooker sent Kew Gardeners for the nether expedition. By December 1860, 100,000 dried seeds, 637 young plants were boarded for shipment to India. In 1677, the plant is mentioned in the London Pharmacopoeia. Marsh fever or ague are old terms for malarial illness. King Charles II was treated with cinchona bark in powdered wine. Linnaeus named cinchona officinalis after the Spanish countess of Chinchon. The acquisition of these plants were against the wishes of the Andean people and were dubious legally, and obvious, obviously not in the interest of people of the lands where they were taken, as they were providing significant in, income to indigenous people. In 1860, cinchona plantations were cultivated in the then Calcutta under British rule. Olivia Arevala Aravello, rest in peace, is a Shibibo Conibo Culanda shot in the chest at 81 years old in Peru by a man from British Columbia who regularly sought ayahuasca. This is a picture of cinchona and the bark, Kina Kina. And here's a picture of Maud Grieve. Why have I included Maud Grieve? Well, she's someone I'm like very fascinated about because she's a no notable herbalist in UK history. She was born in Upper Street in Islington. Her parents died and then her siblings, her and her siblings were separated. She married a man called William Grieve and there's a picture of him with his artifacts that he's appropriated who is the manager of the Bali paper mill near Calcutta, the then called Calcutta, from 1878 to 1894. They lived in India and Maud was introduced to Ayurveda and worked in a medical mission and probably frequented the then called Calcutta Botanical Gardens. It's not easy to find out where she got her extensive, extensive herbal knowledge from. That's something I'd like to research more, but on her return, she founded the Daughters of Ceres, her agricultural school. During World War I, as supplies of medicines dwindled, Mrs. Gree wrote and produced numerous pamphlets explaining the use of specific herbs as remedies against common illnesses, sickness, disease, thus greatly aiding the war effort. Many of these pamphlets were, cl were collated into the work A Modern Herbal, edited by Ms. C, Mrs. C. F. Lyle, the founder of the Society of Herbalists, and it was published in 1931. In 1939, no longer to care for herself, she was placed in the care of Cam the Camberwell House, 30 to 35 Peckham Road, Surrey, a lunatic asylum. She never received any money for her book. Here's a picture of the botanical garden that Maud Grieve probably resided in. It's famous for its 250 year old banyan tree. It was, founded in East, it was founded by the East India Company to cultivate teak and spices. J.D. Hooker, Darwin's best friend, said it's, that was his greatest achievement was the cultivation of tea from China. Cinchona kina kina was grown there too. John Gerard was a barber surgeon. His career catalogued over a thousand rare and, and exotic medicinal plants. There is a great controversy that his herbal of 1597 is plagiarized from the German herbal Don Donates. Um, the reason I put him is this is on the back of the book that I bought a couple of years ago. It says we have as yet no certain proof or experience concerning the virtues of this kind of corn, though the barbarous Indians, which know no better, are constrained to make virtue of necessity and think it good food. Juliette de Barak Levy, I'm going to quote her. From the nomads I want from the nomads I wanted and got the knowledge of how to cultivate my own patch of wheat and corn, how to preserve olive and make beaten oils for my lamps. As I went across a rapidly changing world, I began to acquire a sense of urgency. My journeys by land or sea have always been complicated by taking my animals along. Usually these have been one or two Afghan hounds, but on some travels I have also with me goats, owls and hawks. 
It's a good thing my bees were not movable. I was on faraway traveling, faraway travels, worrying about my bees during the six day war in the small area of Wash Pinna. This, is, this was in Galilee, she had a garden in Galilee. The Nakba in 1948 was a colonial dispossession of the land of more than 1 million Palestinians. Eclectic medicine was a branch of American medicine which made use of indigenous botanical remedies along with other substances and physical therapy practices such as purging and bloodletting. Popular in the latter half of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century amongst colonizers. At this time, indigenous turtle islanders were just permitted to have citizenship. Much of their information was gleaned from weekly government bulletins where the government officials were sent out to gather indigenous medicines and recipes. I wonder how this information was extracted. It's something I want to research more. The T, tea, Essiac T, tea, coined in 1920, is named after Rene Casse, a nurse who was given the recipe by an Ojibwe healer. This name is a symbol of erasure. Medical papyri, often described by European purchasers of graved robbed goods, describe amulets, incantations, preparations, and treatises on spiritual health. Non-medical interventions, anatomy, surgery, diagnostics, such as women's fertility, pregnancy, using hippo, dung, or garlic. The so-called Berlin papyrus is what thought is what thought Galen took a lot of his work from. The Carcoon text is the oldest medical papyrus written in hieratic on women's health care, fertility, pregnancy, and contraception. The Ebers papyrus is 20 meters long and in a general treatise on disease, dentistry, migraines, and it contains the Book of Hearts. The Ramesseum covers gynecology, paediatric medicine, muscles and tendons. The Edwin Smith, imagine calling a papyrus after your own name. The Edwin Smith papyrus, so-called, is about trauma medicine, examination, diagnosis, prognosis. It depicts the liver and the spleen, the kidneys, the bladder, the heart and the womb. The so-called London papyrus is solely describing supernatural acts. The so-called Brooklyn papyrus mentions venoms as medicine. The reason I, I include this is that much of European medicine is generated from medicine of ancient Egypt. Alcohol. Western herbal medicine often promotes fast medicine. Most traditional cultures require long preparation of medicines and the intention is to put the medicine in the medicine making process, like in chanting over the medicine, having intention over the medicine. Recently, a student told me that a patient in clinic had asked from the offset, I do not want an alcoholic tincture. And the response from the tutor and several students were both unsupportive and judgmental. And I thought, let's, re let's reflect on alcohol. Coal is a fine black powder obtained by sublimation. It was then applied to various forms of preparation to the spirits. I find the word spirit interesting because it refers to the extraction of spirit of the plant and pertains to the mind, body and spirit of a plant. In spigeric alchemical extraction of the alcohol, it's called the augment. The spent mark, which is normally thrown away, is burned into mineral salts called calcification. The sulfur is the body, the hot, dry fire, is, and it's considered male. Mercury is the spirit of the plant, and it elicits change and is passive. It is called female. The salt and soul of the plant is the physicality of the plant stripped bare. They're reunited in alchemical preparations and elegant, powerful formulas of medicine are made. Obia or Obea is a colonizer's description of practices of healing and justice used by West African descendants, Akan, Ashanti and Igbo. In the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. The picture on the right 
is a depiction of Nana or Nanny of the Maroons, an Akan woman. She is famous for leading the Maroons in guerrilla defense against the British with use of science, herbal medicine and more. A beer was made illegal after Taki's rebellion when Taki consulted an, an Obia man who made him resistant to the colonizers' bullets, which the colonizers said boosted their confidence for rebellion. Obia practitioners were skilled in using poisons, including of their, for their, of their oppressors. There's a case of a, of a young, I won't say woman, she was 15 years old, a girl called Benetta who obtained put, poison from an Obia man and was tried in 1816. Medu Mimosa Paduca and Phytolaca Americana were used by enslaved people to poison their oppressors. And Kina Kina was used for terminations. Punishment under the Abia Act included flogging and incarceration and the last arrest was in 1976, but the law still exists today. I'm closing with thinking of practical ways we can decolonize and humanize our practice. So back to holism, why do you want to practice or teach herbal medicine? Is it to support healing? There's a saying when I go on marches against deaths in custody, touch one, touch all. So often herbal medicine is taught as a, as a business model um, and is therefore profit for healthcare. But what can we do to share resources? Um, how could we sure, ensure that herbal medicine is accessible for all, that it's sustainable for the planet, that it's radical? Do we pay it forward? Community projects and apothecaries are ways of sharing resources, sharing medicine. Some herbs can be grown in some gardens and other herbs can be grown in others. Community clinics require funding. Um, growing spaces are needed. Jars and barrels to contain the herbs are needed. Do you have any ideas? It's something we need to talk about. Here I've got some pictures of community growing projects. I also wanted to remind us as herbalists that healing, obviously we know this, but it's, it's about diet and food access. It's about accessible to clean water. Water is life. Um, it's about body work, touch, somatic, circadian uh, medicine, talking therapies, massage, access to nature and forests, having chill time and meditation, practicing movement and spiritual healing. I'm going to end the talk with um, some brilliant key points that, um, that Sage Mora um, put on um, the Gaia School of Herbal Medicine site. And I just think it's a brilliant ending to my talk today. Acknowledge and fight against oppression and colonization in herbal medicine. Discuss and acknowledge stolen wisdom. Explore your lineages and indigenous ancestral herbal traditions. Be present with your wounds and pain. Create a space for grieving and mourning, tending to the wounds of oppression and colonization. All herbal traditions and lineages should be represented. There needs to be a recognition and inclusion of individual and community voices. Include and represent oral histories. There should be a balance of wisdom sources and be mindful of co cultural appropriation. Elevate marginalized voices in herbal traditions. Herb and tr herbal traditions are spiritual traditions. Do not elevate Western titles and terms. Do not elevate Western training or tools. Tokenizing, avoid tokenizing or, or exotifying, exos exotifying indigenous cultures and people and let's get back to rewilding our diets and our lifestyle lamb back 